morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to continue our study into bonding with our lesson on Vesper today. Um, basically, so far we've been doing Lewis pictures. We've been uh, using uh, valence electrons. We've been satisfying people's octet. Vesper is just this next layer on top of it. And Vesper is something that we can do once you know the Lewis structure. So again, a reminder, you need to make sure you can do your Lewis very quickly. So you can actually start identifying the geometry. Uh, we will be using symmetry as a part of our argument as well. Uh, but the fun part of this one is actually looking at some 3D shapes. Uh, we'll actually need to start representing different bond angles. Uh, one of my favorite lessons, um, I'm going to give you a link of a uh, FET simulation that I'm going to show you uh, later on this lesson as well. Do you play around with a little bit, see if you can visualize the 3D angles and the structures for yourself. Uh, there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, names of the different structures and the geometries. Yes, you do need to memorize the names as well as the bond angles, but you're going to find as you get more practice with it, it'll come uh, second nature to you. So. Uh, without further ado here, you can find these Vesper notes here under the handouts column here. Uh, you can scribble over as we go through here. So uh, we predict this theory here. We call the ve uh, theory Vesper. Vesper is an acronym here. It's I know it looks like Vesper, right? But uh, this Vesper here, the VF stands for valence shell. So we're specifically looking at the outermost electrons because those are the ones that we care about. Uh, we talk about electrons. Electrons, no surprise, are coming to us in pairs. So we have electrons, all of them are negatives. And the thing that we're going to learn is not only do these electron pairs, the two electrons in the pair, hate each other, the electron pair itself, that partner, actually uh, hates other partners around it. So um, they sometimes like asking you the question, uh, what um, principle does Vesper, uh, what is it based off of? It's based off of the fact that the electrons in the outermost shell, they repel each other. And basically, because they repel, doesn't matter whether they're either bonding electrons or non-bonding electrons. They could be bonding like single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds. They could be non-bonding like dots like that. Basically, wherever you have electrons, they're going to repel. They're going to push each other far away. And basically, we're going to end up with a geometry. Basically, when the electrons are in positions that minimize these repulsions, another way of saying that there is you can say maximize the bond angle. Basically, electrons all being negative charge, they want to push as far away from each other as possible. As we go through this lesson here, we will visit this terminology quite a lot. We'll call this one here an electron domain. I'm going to shorthand it an ED. An electron domain is simply a domain means a region. So it's an area, it's a space around the central atom that has some negative density, be it single bond, double bond, triple, lone pair like I mentioned. The surprising thing here, let me just draw a molecule. We drew HCN uh, two days ago here. The surprising thing here when we do Vesper, first thing is we're only going to look at one center at a time. If I happen to be able to have a larger molecule that actually has multiple centers, I'm going to do the Vesper around each center one by one. Uh, the nice thing here is, so the single bond cancels the domain here. This triple bond, I know it's a lot more electron rich. It's six electrons as opposed to here it's only two electrons. But being a triple bond and being squeezed between carbon and nitrogen, this one here only counts as one domain. So in this case here, this molecule here, I would count one domain on this side, one domain. This is a center atom that has two domains, a multiple bond. All that electron density in that cloud is actually constrained, it's squished between the two centers, so that only counts as one domain. As you start looking at geometries here, there's two different types of geometries. For starters, sometimes the geometries are the same. We're going to look out as far as where the orbitals are, not even worried about the attachments. So just looking at these two domains, not really caring about the H and the N, we can call that an orbital or an electron domain geometry. That's a new name of it. It's just if I could see these orbitals, I can point the bond angle. I can figure out how many degrees are these angles apart from each other. And sometimes it will be the same, many times different from what we refer to as the molecular geometry, which is the actual shape. When it says the actual shape, you gave me the molecules HCN, I'm interested in studying how is the H in relation to the C in relation to the N, are they straight across, are they at an L, are they bent, I want to know that geometry. So how this lesson is laid out here is we're going to start off, I've given you some sample compounds. Uh, each compound here we're going to start off just with a smaller number of electron domains, we're going to go two all the way through six on the back side. Uh, the compounds I've selected for you will belong to these categories. It's not like CO2 can come back later on and suddenly, oh, I want to be three domains. No, CO2 will always have two domains. Right? So as you go through two domains, three domains, again, our hope is to get through to six domains uh, in this lesson. 
starting off here, you can't do any Vesper stuff here without drawing a Lewis picture. So hopefully you've had enough practice with this here. Carbon is valence of 4, oxygen is 6 valence electrons times 2. So I have 16 electrons. You plop down the carbon any which way. So far we've been drawing it very symmetrically here, single bonds first. By the time you get to filling up your oxygens on the outside, everyone else is happy but carbon's not. In the case that you run out, we start making double bonds. We saw with yesterday's lesson on um, formal charges, the symmetrical one, double-double, actually had less formal charges than a triple single. So that there is a Lewis picture. We're ready to now do Vesper on this. What I want to show you again here is Lewis is helpful. It shortcuts the Bohr model. But to be a correct Lewis diagram here, this one here is also a correct Lewis diagram. Where you have carbon, it's still double bonded, double bonded, it's still symmetrical and all that, and everyone has a full octet, Lewis would say both of these are correct. Because today I'm interested in the geometry, I'm actually interested in the angles between these domains here, I do want to be able to decide or get a principle like Vesper to actually figure out, well, which one is it going to likely be? Is it going to be drawing number one or is it going to be drawing number two? Again, for Vesper, we are only going to focus on one center at a time. So in this case here, the carbon is center atom. What I'm going to count is the number of electron domains. So this double bond here counts as one domain, this domain counts as one, this one is a domain, this one is a domain. What I'm going to care is these electrons of the domain, they all have negative charge. They all hate each other. So in this case, my electron domains are only 90 degrees apart, whereas in this case here, they're actually 180 degrees apart. In which case, will the pushing away of electrons maximize the bond angle so that repulsion will actually be minimized? Hopefully you were able to say the 180 degrees here. That's why I would decide against this. Although notwithstanding, this one here is actually a correct Lewis picture. So if they said draw a Lewis picture and you drew it like this, you'll get full marks for that. It's just a little bit misleading because that actually doesn't generate, uh, um, demonstrate the real angles that we have. I'm going to refer you to a nice FET simulation where you can actually play around with some of these molecules here. Uh, you can actually start off with our center atom, which is our purple. Our carbon has a double-double, so I'm just going to tap the double bond. If I have just two atoms connected, it's always going to be linear. There's only two ways that these guys here can be straight across. But my carbon actually has a double-double. It actually has two domains. And that's what's happening here. Realistically, these four electrons that make up the double bond, they're just constrained between the two columns. That's why they count as one domain. Anytime the oxygens get close to the carbon on the other side here, the other domain will push away from each other just because the negative hates the negative. So far for your electron domain geometry or orbital geometry here, because the carbon and the orbitals are just straight across, they're all along a line, we're going to call that linear. In a second here, we're also called the molecular geometry, where the C and the oxygen O's are. Because the domains themselves were 180 degrees across, the domains were linear, the whole molecule is actually linear. And any time the carbon dioxide tried to be bent on itself here, the other electron would run away from it, and basically uh, it's going to keep this in a linear geometry. So let's see if we can go back to the OneNote here. So we're going to name these shapes here. You do need to know these names for a two electron domain case. Starting off with the electron domain geometry, we're going to use that terminology linear because linear has the bond angle 180 degrees. It has the negatives far apart. Your molecular geometry in this case here, not super interesting. Molecular geometry looks even further than just where the electron domains are. It actually looks at where the C and the O's and the O's, because the O's are the ends of the linear orbitals. This one here would also be called linear. Again, you do need to know the names of these shapes as well as the bond angles. So carbon dioxide here, although this is a correct Lewis diagram in uh, picture number two here, we prefer to draw in number one. This will do you good in the long run when we look at polarity later on. Let's make things more interesting here. Look at a little bit larger molecules. Uh, we have BF3. Boron is 3 electrons. Thorium is 7 times 3. So we have 24 electrons. While I'm at it, I'm going to go 6. 6 times 2. So we have here 20. Is it 24 electrons? No, sorry, 18 electrons. So make sure you have a tally. Make sure you have a total number of electrons. When they start off with the Lewis picture, you can draw the Lewis however you like. For all I care, I can draw the three fluorines like this. That is a correct Lewis diagram. I've connected them with a single bond. I'm making the outside guys happy. Make sure you have all the dots, or else it's not a correct Lewis picture. At that point, I've used up all 24 electrons. Um, in this case here, I would usually say boron is unhappy, but we saw yesterday boron is one of those incomplete octets. Boron experimentally is found happy with six electrons, so this boron here is actually happy already. As it pertains to Lewis, perfectly fine. I've used up all 24. Everyone has the full octet. Everyone is happy. 
but geometrically do we expect this is the way it's going to form? This boron trifluoride here has three domains. Single bonds here count as three domains here. Well, the domains are all very electron rich. There's negative density in there, and negatives just want to push away from each other. In this case here, just like earlier, the bond angle here is a lot tinier than it could be. So what's going to happen here is, let's imagine holding this fluorine uh, uh, steady, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually push the other electrons until the other fluorines are actually maximally far apart, until we actually get a diagram where we have, say, boron. This is, should be the maximum far apart these guys can be. Right. Basically, I took the 300 degrees that would have, uh, sorry, the 360 degrees that would have made the entire circle. I chopped it into three. Basically, your bond angle here is now 120. If this one suddenly became 125, then these ones here will be tighter than 120. They would repel away from each other. I actually do have access to 3D space as well. It turns out the flat molecule is better because you can imagine it being flat versus trying to draw in sort of three dimensions here. We'll do the three dimensions in the next case here. When they're not uh, flat like this, basically, let's say the flat plane would have been on the bottom here. When they're sort of pushed up like this, again, their bond angles are a little bit tighter than they could have been. They're going to push themselves until they're flat again, so that they're actually 180 degrees flat on top as well. So there we go. We have the bond angle between the fluorines is 120. It is going to be flat, so we're going to give this a name here. The molecular, uh, sorry, the um, electron domain geometry, the orbital geometry, for the three domain case here, because they end up forming a triangle, we're going to call this trigonal, or you can say triangular is fine. Trigonal, because we're flat, we're going to use the terminology planar. And that's actually going to be true for all the three electron domain keys, the BF3 that we just did, as well as the SO2 that we're going to do next. So trigonal planar basically means the triangle's uh, formation here is going to be 120 degrees apart. The orbital electron domain geometry only looks as far as the orbitals. If I actually do have fluorines on the endings of all these, I can actually quote for you where the fluorines are. Well, the fluorines are also in that triangular flat shape. At least the molecular geometry, this one here, is also going to be trigonal planar. Uh, just another name for it here is you can say triangular planar as well. Uh, just make sure you can say it's triangular and flat. You need to memorize the name of that shape there. So trigonal planar. So, so far we've done two examples, the electron domain and the molecular geometry are the same. Here, SO2 is the first time we're actually going to see a difference. So starting off with Lewis, I'm just going to randomly plop them down. Lewis doesn't care the geometry. Uh, by the time we have 18 electrons, by the time we get to this picture, I've drawn all 18, I've run out. Sulfur is not an incomplete octet, it's not happy yet. So all we're going to do is we're going to squeeze electrons in. Remember we had said this always looks dative. I need to do it brute force to actually figure out whether it is or not. Uh, I don't believe it is. So in this case here, I drag those electrons in. I tried to draw them as symmetrical as I can because the electrons would already be farther apart in this uh, arrangement. How does this sulfur here, I focus on one central atom. How does this one here has three domains? I'm gonna circle them for you. In this case here, single bond counts as a domain. The double bond counts as one domain, even though it's a more rich electron domain. The lone pair itself is actually counting as the third domain here. So this sulfur dioxide, SO2, also is based off three domains. That's why it's in this category here. When these three orbitals here push away from each other, these electrons hate these ones, hate these ones, they will likewise push away until they're 120 degrees apart. So we're going to go sulfur. I'm going to plop the double bond down this way. This is trying to represent the 3D geometry. Lewis didn't care. This is a correct Lewis diagram. This is a correct Lewis diagram. But if you know the geometry, this will do you good in the long run, especially when we start doing polarity. So, so far, let me just do the orbital geometry, electron domain geometry. These three are also in a triangular flat shape. What would have been what I expected to be 120 degrees is also called trigonal planar, so electron domain is trigonal planar. Molecular geometry is different, though. Molecular geometry is I said the molecule is SO2. I only have O's on the ends of two of these sides. So I know my shape is based off being a triangular flat shape, trigonal planar. This time, however, if I just look at the S and the two O's, this time we're not linear, we're not directly across. Because this domain here is still electron rich, it keeps my two orbitals from going back to the flat shape. So the molecular geometry, uh, fancy name here, we're going to call it bent. Uh, the bent angle, you can call it angular, because this one here is at an angle. It's not linear, it's not straight across. Or you can also call it V-shaped, because if this one here rotated around, it sort of looks like a V. 
just a quick comment on uh, bond angles here. It's important for you to remember, well, 360 divided by 3 is 120. We're supposed to be 120. In fact, when we're a single bond like this, I want to emphasize here, it's like the electrons are squeezed between the boron and fluorine. They can't go too far out on either side. This time, similarly, we have four electrons squeezed between sulfur and oxygen. They can't really go too far out because they're sort of attracted to the sulfur and oxide nuclei. This time we have a lone pair, however, it's like having one balloon that's larger than the other balloons. There's no oxygen on this end here that's sort of confining it in space. So basically this lone pair here, these two electrons can actually broaden out. We say that this one here, they diffuse out, they spread out. And in fact, what's going to happen is because of this diffusion, it's actually going to push any leftover bond angles tighter than they were to begin with. So these ones here, based off a trigonal planar, would have been 120. Usually you quote something less than 120. Usually I quote a couple of degrees smaller, 117. The actual number will actually depend on uh, the actual, well, it really is a double bond and a single bond. Maybe they push different amounts, but what we do know is going to be something less than 120. I've seen it go as far down as like 105, 106. All you just need to say is something less than 120 because the lone pair is more diffuse. That is another principle that Vesper is based off of. Trying to give you a hint for your test here. Vesper is based off of the fact that electrons repel each other. Another principle here is lone pairs are more diffuse, and they end up pushing the leftover bonds here tighter than they would have been. Let's go back to our simulation here if we can. Uh, so let's remove it. Let's start off with a boron trifluoride, three single bonds. When I have three bonds here, we have a perfect uh, 360 divided by 3, so 120 degrees apart. Whenever one of these arms here tries to get close to the other one here, um, the other two arms try to pull away from each other, you'll notice that we are flat because anytime I try to make you in 3D, uh, the bond angles, again, are a little bit too close together. Even though I do have access to 3D space, we're going to end up being flat. So there we go, trigonal planar. Molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. Let's try out the single double with lone pair. You'll notice we're still based off a triangular flat shape. Just because we've erased the attachment on this side doesn't mean that there's no electron density. In fact, this electron density is that diffuse, that bigger balloon. This bigger balloon will end up squeezing the leftover bonds here tighter. What would have been actually 120 is now going to be something, you can just say less than 120 or 117, 118 or so. And just like before, anytime one of these bonds here tries to get close to another one here, the other electrons will repel until we're flat again. So there we go, that's trigonal planar. That's for the three electron domain case. Now we're starting to get more complicated with four domains. Again, for all this, you need to start off with Lewis. So hopefully you're really good at uh, drawing uh, these Lewis pictures here. Uh, on your handout, these diagrams will show up a little bit better, but let's just start off with a Lewis. Methane is just carbon single bonded to four hydrogens. So those are the four domains there. Ammonia, by the time you uh, draw your correct diagram, you're gonna have one lone pair. Water is gonna be two lone pairs like this. Right, they all have eight uh, total electrons. What we need to then say again is, well, what's the molecular geometry? Sorry, what's the, I keep saying molecular. What's the electron domain geometry? If I have four balloons, all of them contain negative density, all of them are pushing away from each other, how far away can these bond angles get? If we were stuck on a flat plane, we would say, well, it's 360 divided by four, we would be as drawn here, most chemistry textbooks here would show it as 90 degrees. The question, however, here is we don't necessarily need to stay flat. If I can come up with some 3D shape, some geometry that ends up having angles that are bigger than 90, my balloons would push away from being flat and push towards the other state there. So let's try it out here. Uh, let's actually use the simulation for simplicity here. Uh, if I can just pull back here. Uh, you're going to have the simulation here uh, as a link on your handout section. Uh, I'll just close that there. So methane has four single bonds. So far we've done three, which is boron trifluoride, which is a trigonal planar. I wanted to stay flat. What if I attach one more? We're actually going to end up with this shape here. You'll notice we're in 3D. We notice we're not flat anymore. We're actually not going to be that sort of uh, T, that sort of flattened out shape. We're actually going to look like this shape here. They've actually given you the name of the shape here. We call this shape here a tetrahedral. I believe from your math class, it's f definitely four-sided. It's four equilateral triangles, three equilateral triangles on top, one equilateral triangle on the bottom. You'll notice this bond angle here, mainly for us, it's bigger than 90. So we're going to revert away from that 90 degree shape to this shape here. And just like before, anytime one of these arms here gets too close to the other one here, we're going to then revert down to a tetrahedral. Now we run into a little bit of problem because the 3D shape here actually has better angles for us. How do we draw 3D on a 2D piece of paper? 
So what's going to happen is realistically this molecule here will be twisting and rotating around a whole bunch. What's going to happen here is you're going to try to twist this molecule so that as many bonds as you can will lie on a flat plane. I'm going to try to draw, let's say, this one going up and down, and this one down and to the left is totally on a flat plane. In that orientation, you see one of them peeking out behind and one of them peeking out in front. So in that situation there, we're going to draw these ones here that are on the plane, just with solid line, solid line. I'm going to give you a different notation for the one that physically jumps off the page. It's in front of the page at you. The other one actually peeks behind the page. And I'm going to use the dash notation to go backwards. So I'm going to use symbols to try to represent the 3D geometry. So what's going to happen here, you have a nice shaded diagram to try to show you carbon, hydrogen. Let's do the one that's in the page. You're going to have one that's sort of backwards, one that's sort of uh, in the front here. The shading helps a little bit so you can see the tetrahedral. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce some notation. Same thing, I'm going to put the carbon. The one up and the one to the side so far are on the plane of the page. So I'm going to just use a solid bond here. The one that looks like it's jumping in front of the page, I'm going to imagine having taken a hydrogen, pulling it off the page, and it leaving a shadow behind. And because it's leaving a shadow, I'm going to use a wedge notation. I'm drawing it in red. This H here is actually sitting physically in front of the page. The other one, the H that was peeking behind the page, I'm actually going to use a dash symbol. I'm pushing the H behind the page, and behind the page here was this dash symbol. So for dash, it means into page. Yes, you do need to be able to draw this with wedges and dashes later. The wedge represents out of page. And I don't know if you can see it here. What we have here is a triangle on the bottom, and we have with the top, we have a three triangles on top as well, four-sided shape called the tetrahedral. So because all three of these molecules here are based off the four-sided shape, that's bigger than the 90. The 90 would revert to the shape. Next time you have balloons, tie four balloons together, you'll naturally get this shape because all the balloons are fighting for space and they're going to push away until they have the biggest bond angles. So electron domain geometry, it's going to be called the tetrahedron or tetrahedral. That's true for all the four electron domain case. For the methane, where it actually has the H's on the f all four sides, well, the shape of it is also going to be tetrahedral. So molecular geometry, also tetrahedral, no problem. Uh, I think in IB Math, uh, they actually ask you to calculate the bond angle for this. We're just going to take their answer. This angle, we're expecting it to be something bigger than 90. It's quoted at 109.5. So the way I remember it here is I imagine I listened to a radio station 109.5. So basically, every time you have tetrahedral, we're based off 109.5. Let's go over to ammonia and go over to water. Ammonia here also has four domains. It's also going to be based off the tetrahedral, one in the plane of the page, one dash, and one wedge like this. But again, what we have is a lone pair. This lone pair counts as a fourth domain. This fourth domain here is a bigger balloon than the leftover arms. So the bond angles, which used to be 109.5, get squeezed in a little bit tighter. If I test the ammonia molecule here, the bond angle between these guys is only about 107 couple of degrees smaller, not wrong if you said 106, it really depends on the exact molecule. So ammonia here, I draw it in that fashion. And similarly for the water, this is actually a little bit misleading. It looks like water should be linear because water actually is still based off a of four domain case. Water also has O and H, or you can even draw an H like that. It also has a lone pair back and a lone pair of forwards. Those lone pairs are actually more diffuse. It's not like they're erased so that the oxygen can stay in a line anymore. Those lone pairs will squeeze the bonds even tighter than they were before. For water, it's nice to know the bond angle, 104.5. So based on those numbers there, I memorized the 109.5 as a radio station, minus 2.5 to get to ammonia, minus 2.5 to get to water. A couple of degrees smaller for every lone pair that diffuses out, for every lone pair that uh, stretches out for you, which is why it explains to you Molecular geometry-wise here, the uh, water is actually bent. And this bent is actually different from the angular and the bent from before. This one already was at 109.5. This one now is bent 104 degrees. Earlier, we had a bent of maybe 117 because we were based off trigonal planar. Molecular geometry for ammonia here, similarly speaking, is uh, just to give it a name. It's a slightly shortened uh, triangular pyramid. So where a triangle is on top, we have a triangle on the bottom of this pyramid. It's a slightly sort of flattened out tetrahedron. We're going to call this one here a trigonal or triangular. 
and we're going to say pyramid. Sometimes they like adding an O at the end. So trigonal pyramidal. Yes, you need to memorize that name there. And that represents the molecular geometry. I know I'm based off of full tetrahedron, but if you just look at where the N's and where the H's show up, it's just that bottom region that makes a triangular pyramid. So let me see if I can show you that on the simulation here. For ammonia, we have three single bonds and one of them as a lone pair here. You'll notice we are still based off a tetrahedron. We're still based off of having that tripod uh, kind of shape here. But if I just talk about the molecular geometry, just the purple and where the H's actually are, it's a slightly short, shorter tri triangular pyramid. We are not flat. That's actually going to give us some polarity later on. And the reason we're not flat is because we're based off a trigonal, uh, a tetrahedral geometry. So a really easy principle of Vesper, uh, electrons hate each other, they just keep pushing away until um, the bond angles are large enough. Now onto the back side, let's just finish off. Okay, I'm going to give you a summary chart here later on if I can find it. Um, that'll give you the names of these shapes along with one way of drawing these pictures. Not the only way, but uh, you could uh, refer to this chart here to do it later on. So on the back side here, I've left you with the five electron domain case. Like we mentioned, we're going to go to six electron domain. This is the additional higher level stuff. Standard level will stop there. Uh, right away, alarm bell should be ringing for you here. We're going to have a central atom. And these guys here around them are going to have five domains. If every domain is at least two electrons, already I have 10 electrons. Already this one here, I have 12 electrons. These ones were my exceptions from yesterday. These ones are expanded octets. So these ones here have to be period 3 and lower. They have to actually be using their d orbitals for bonding. Sort of the same analysis here. Mr. Savari's uh, been nice to you. He's given you the Lewis pictures. You have to do Lewis before you can do any Vesper stuff. That's why you want to be really fast with Lewis. And basically what we want to ask is, there's five places that are negative, and they all push away from each other. How big could the angles get? Um, shouldn't be surprising to you here. We already used 3D space for the four electron domain case here. Let's use 3D space for this one. The, this one here is actually a combination of two shapes we've seen already. It's also two different types of bonding, which leaves us with a little bit more analysis later on. What we're going to be combining is actually phosphorus. It's going to have one back, one in the front, one to the side. That there is actually the same as a trigonal planar. I'm sort of looking at it uh, horizontally here. We call these ones here the equatorial positions because they're the flat positions and we're actually going to combine it with the axial we'll combine it with the linear let's plop another chlorine up here and another chlorine down here those ones there are referred to as axial positions basically we subbed on this part was linear and we subbed it up and down based off of this flat plane here that part there was a trigonal planar so it's a combination of two shapes that we've seen already it's actually two different types of bonding uh, if you tie five balloons together, it'll revert to this shape. So there's actually two different types of bond angles here. Between the flat equatorial positions and the straight up and down, we definitely have a 90 degrees. For the trigonal planar, we had said take 360 divided by 3. We actually have here just 120 degrees. So because I have two different types of bonds, I have a 90 degree angle and a 120 degree angle. Uh, the molecular geometry of this one here, we have a triangular middle. Because of the one up, I have a pyramid that's on top. Because of the one that's down, I also have a pyramid on the bottom. I have a shape that's triangular with two pyramids. I'm going to call, yes, got it right this time, electron domain geometry. I'm going to call it the trigonal bipyramidal. I'm going to call it triangular base, triangular in the middle, but it has two pyramids, one pyramid overlaid with a, another upside down pyramid on the bottom. The electron domain geometry for all of these is going to be uh, trigonal bipyramidal. Molecular geometry-wise is going to be different, though. It depends on where the atoms actually are, have any of them become lone pairs. So what's going to happen here is for PCL5, if you can actually see where the CLs are, the molecular geometry is also going to be tri-bipyramidal, so trigonal with two pyramids. As I start losing lone pairs here, uh, I'm going to do the answer first, and then we'll talk about why. It's always good, because I have two different types of bonds, it's always good to actually take off the equatorial positions first. So out of the five, I would have been based off a trigonal bipyramidal, but if one of them has now become a lone pair, I pull off one of these lone pairs. I'll show this to you on the simulation in a second here. We're going to have chloride, uh, sulfur, oh sorry, they're using fluoride, so fluoride, fluoride. This one sort of makes a fulcrum. We have the up and down that's sort of straight across. This sort of becomes a bench. 
and we're going to call this like an elementary school. We had a, a rocking board here that would rock back and forth between this uh, fulcrum here. The molecular geometry of this middle one here is referred to as a seesaw, very fancy language here, like a teeter-totter. So seesaw. The bond angles here, one of them has become a, a lone pair, so it's more diffuse. Where it would have been 120 degrees, I might quote here maybe 119 or 118, something, something smaller than 120. It still probably has a 90 degree angle or 89, something smaller. Let's keep going from there here. Again, the answer is I'm going to pull off the equatorial positions first. I pulled off one, I pulled off another. That should leave you with just a T-shape. So chloron, trifluoride, Lewis picture doesn't care. It doesn't care the where the bond angles are. But when this finally works its way out, I have Cl, F, and F. These ones here would have been the axial ones. This one here would have been one arm of the trigonal planar. These ones here would probably be 90 degrees. We have the lone pairs, two lone pairs, keeping it in this orientation. So the molecular geometry, the name of it, is called T-shaped because I look like a T. And lastly, when I pull off the last equatorial position here, I pull off all three of these. I just end up with actually three eyes that are just straight across. We had done this molecule a couple lessons ago here. It was charged, so the charge in the corner there. Uh, for a correct Vesper diagram, you actually don't need to include all the lone pairs. But as we're just learning it here, I can see that we're still based off of five dots here. And all that we have left is actually the axial, the board of the, the seesaw, the teeter-totter. So this is actually another way of us getting a linear geometry here. And we're going to end up with that shape. So let me just show you that uh, some of these geometries here. Uh, the first molecule with five single bonds here. Again, we have access to 3D space. We have trigonal bipyramidal. Let's see if you can see that here. We have a triangle in the middle. We have the one up, one down. Those are the axial. I put one of them in the plane on the page, so just a single bond. This one here is jumping off the page at me. This is the wedge notation. This one here is the dash. I have a trigonal planar all at 120 degrees. With the one on the top, it makes a pyramid on the top. With the one on the bottom, it makes a pyramid on the bottom. It's trigonal with two pyramids. Then we had a situation with four single bonds and one lone pair. Again, we are based off of uh, the trigonal bipyramidal. So we have triangular planar in the middle here. I've lost the equatorial position, and now I have that fulcrum. My axial ones end up making a teeter-totter. Let's see if I can rock this back and forth so you can see the teeter-totter in motion here. So here's the fulcrum, the wedge coming off the page, the dash going behind. The teeter-totter board is just going up and down like this, and it would just rock up and down like this. So that's why we call it a teeter-totter shape. Because of the lone pair, it doesn't let this revert uh, back into any other shape. Uh, the next one here, I'll show you one more with a T-shape. So I have three and then two lone pairs. We're still based off a trigonal uh, bipyramidal. Triangular planar in the middle. I've removed two of them as equatorial positions, and I'm left with this T. You can, by extension for triiodide, imagine this one also becomes a lone pair. Where the three eyes actually are, they're just straight across. The bond angle will be 180 degrees, so that one will be linear. I shortcut it a little bit here because for trigonal bipyramidal, there's actually two different types of bonds. I have some bonds that are 120 degrees on the trigonal planar, the equatorial positions. I have some that are 90 degrees with the axial positions here. It's actually going to matter which one I actually make a lone pair first. And the moral of the story here is when you make a single bond and lone pair, that lone pair with the other bonds have to be as far away as possible. We've already been saying negatives hate each other, they just push away from each other. Because lone pairs are actually more diffuse, this balloon is actually going to be larger than this balloon. So here's one last principle for Vesper. Not only are the balloons going to be more diffuse, they're going to be more spread out. We actually want, in a case like this where we have two lone pairs, we want the lone pair, lone pair bond angle to be as big as it can be. In this case here, it looks like it's about 120. If instead I put a lone pair up here, axial and one that's equatorial, my lone pair, lone pair, the biggest balloons that are pushing the most are actually too close together. That's why we end up using our equatorial first. That's actually what this chart here summarizes for you here. If you look at that molecule here with two uh, electron domains here, it looks at what if I end up pulling off uh, the two balloons? What if I pull off both the equatorial, which is going to be the answer? What if I pull off one of them that's on the trigonal planar, one of them that's axial? What if I pull off both the axial ones? And basically, here is the principle that I'm working off of. I know electrons in general, they hate each other. They just push each other far away. But there is a relative order. Because these balloons are the biggest, the strongest repulsion will be between lone pair and lone pair. 
what's given to you in this chart, you never need to summarize these numbers, but what's given to you in this chart here is when you've done this, when you pulled off the two lone pairs in these arrangements here, it's actually tracked what's the bond angle between lone pair and lone pair. When I have both the equatorial and the answer, my lone pairs are off by 120, that's why it says 120 here. If I pulled off both of them as axial, that's actually the best. If I've made one of them, one lone pair here, one lone pair here, the biggest repulsion lone pair, lone pair is biggest, that's actually 180. It probably wouldn't be 90 degrees. If I pulled off one of them that's on the page, uh, one of them that's uh, axial, that's only 90. Because this bonding goes too tiny, I'm probably going to decide against B. Between A and C, C is so far better. But again, it's a compromise between the other bonds as well. The next strongest repulsion is between my lone pairs and my leftover bonds. In this case here, my lone pairs and the bonds would be 90 degrees. So in this case here, if I did both axial, I have six things that are 90. If I did the other one, the lone pair, lone pair is not quite as good. But when I do that there, between lone pair and all my leftover bonds, while I do still have a few 90s, I do also still have some 120s. Again, it's the compromise between all the bonds that are left over. I want all the bonds to be as large as possible, relatively prioritizing first lone pair, lone pair. In this case here, because I have six 90s, but I have two that are actually bigger than 90, this combination ends up being better than the early one. Again, that's a summary. Long story short, just make sure uh, you pull off the equatorials before you pull off the lone pairs. And that was only because we actually have two different types of bonds uh, in this shape here. Lots of variety and lots of complexity in this uh, five election domain case. Uh, we're going to do a lab later on where you can actually, uh, if we had model kits where you can actually build them, uh, you'll probably need to use the simulation to build it virtually. You can practice drawing the Lewis. Lewis doesn't care the geometry, but you can try using that wedge and DAS notation to actually figure out the 3D shape. Lastly here, we're going to do six election domains. This is a lot easier than what we saw before. This was actually the geometry we saw back in our chapter three. We can pretend this center atom is a transition metal. Imagine we're surrounded by six ligands. This time in 3D shape, the bond that goes the best is going to be is going to be 90 degrees. See so if you remember the name of the shape here, the electron domain for molecules with six electron domains, we're going to call this one here. This time it's a square in the middle. We're not going to be triangular base. But this time because we're perfectly, we're actually four triangles on top, four triangles on the bottom. It's an eight-sided shape. We're going to call this one here a octahedral. So octahedral basically has everything at 90 degrees, and that's going to be true for all three of these molecules that have six domains. And again, sometimes it's similar to molecular geometry, sometimes it's different. Uh, in this case here, the molecular geometry, if you can see the sulfur, it's being attacked left, right, it's being attacked top down, it's being attacked front back. Uh, there's a reason why I don't draw in this orientation. Let's show you in a second here. Uh, basically, that geometry is being surrounded by all sides. Again, for a 3D shape, you can be a little sloppy. You don't necessarily need to have all the lone pairs. Lone pairs are needed for a Lewis picture. If you have all the attachments, everything is 90 degrees away from each other here. Molecular geometry is likewise going to be octahedral. And just like we've been doing throughout this lesson, what if I gave you another molecule which also has six? It's also expanded. But what if we start making some of them those balloons, some of them a lone pair? This time, because we're perfectly symmetrical here, it doesn't matter which one you pull off. There is no equatorial axial anymore. Let's imagine pulling off that bottom one. I'm still going to be surrounded by chlorines sort of all around me. The chlorines are still going to be roughly in a square, maybe a little bit less than 90 degrees flat across because the lone pair is diffuse. But you have to remember there is still a chlorine on this side. It can't get too, too much farther on the close side here because this bond would also repel from each other as well. So yes, you might be able to quote maybe 89 degrees. It's okay to say even 90 for that because the bond angles are getting fairly tight. This time I just need a name for this shape here. Where the selenium and the chlorines actually are, we form a square base. We're not flat because we had the one up. We're actually going to be um, a pyramid. So the molecular geometry here is called square pyramidal. So it's a square base pyramid. And similarly here with xenon tetrafluoride, a little bit weird, xenon is already a noble gas. We end up actually just getting the xenon with the four fluorines. I'm going to have lone pairs because lone pairs repair lone pairs the most. I'm going to have those bonds here farthest apart, so that's 180 degrees. So therefore it leaves me with a flat plane on the bottom here. And if you can guess it here, we're going to be square, or almost like an X shape, but we're going to be square, but because we're flat, we're back to becoming planar. So lots of names and lots of bond angles for you to deal with. 
but really Vesper bases off of the really simple principle electrons hate each other they want to push away from each other lone pairs are more diffuse they push leftover bonds even tighter than they were before uh, and then especially in the five domain case we had all that variety which bonds do I pull off first I pull off the equatorial first now the reason why one last comment for a lesson the reason why I don't normally I would twist it so that the majority of bonds are actually on the plane of the page when everything is perfectly 90 I can draw sulfur with fluorines perfectly straight across that's perfectly good but what's going to happen here is if you look at 90 degrees the one that's in and out will be perfectly right out of the page and right into the page in physics you're going to actually use for magnetic field you're going to use like x's for symbols that go directly into the page dots for coming out but instead of actually showing it directly head on and directly vice versa what we're going to do is i'm actually going to twist it a little bit I'm going to rotate it along this top axis here. I'm actually going to have sulfur. It's going to have two fluorines behind the page, two fluorines in front of the page. That way I can avoid the one that's jumping directly off the page at you. And I'm going to still have the one up and the one down. In that case, that's a slightly easier way of drawing the octahedral. Let me just show it to you with the simulation again. So octahedral should have six bonds, so six vertices, but it's an eight-sided shape. Four triangles on top, four triangles on the bottom. What I just mentioned there is if I draw most of the bonds here on the page, so straight line, straight line, we're going to have one straight off, and I'm not even going to see the one behind. I'd rather just twist it a little bit here. By drawing it slightly at the angle, I have the two that are wedged that are behind the page. Uh, sorry, two that are dashed. Two that are wedged that jump off the top of the page. That forms that square base for me. The one up ends up forming the pyramid on top. The one on the bottom forms the pyramid on the bottom because they're all equilateral uh, triangles. This is a perfectly octahedral shape. Let me just show you the uh, one with the lone pair. Uh, so there we go. We're still based off uh, octahedral shape, but I'm going to put the lone pair, let's say, at the bottom here. Again, what I would recommend you do is two wedges that jump off the page, two dashes that go behind the page. That's a square uh, in the middle here with the one up and ends up making a square base uh, pyramid. So I'm going to give you a summary chart to help summarize some of this, uh, the bond angles, the names of the shapes, and then you're going to have a lab to work on some of these molecules. Make use of the simulation, make sure you can start seeing in 3D, and be comfortable with the wedges on the dash. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, guys. Take care.